tell me, who hasn't ever dreamed of a cruise around the Greek islands? Stopping by Mykonos, Santorini, Rhodes, or the more than 1,000 islands that Greece has spread throughout the Aegean. We are almost talking about a paradise, about the holy grail of the pre-COVID tourist. Who could resist such a journey? I can only think of one such person, Recep Tayyip Erdogan. I'm really sorry if I got that pronunciation completely wrong. Friends, these hundreds of Greek islands in the Aegean Sea have become a nightmare for the Turkish president's plans. And in Athens, they are perfectly aware of this. And of course, after seeing what happened to Jamal Khashoggi and Taken 2 with Liam Neeson, you know, instant bull is no joking matter. Precisely because of this, in this video, we are going to look at how Greece is preparing for what may happen. Are you ready? Well, let's get into it. Not long ago, Greece and Turkey were in the news because of an earthquake. But dear friends of visual politic, the clashes between Ankara and Athens have been beyond seismic since way back. For example, the last significant clash has been on the account of what is happening in the eastern Mediterranean, where, under the sea, in the subsoil, natural gas has been found. A raw material that Erdogan is not willing to give up, even a single cubic meter of. But of course, the question is whether or not it is really up to Turkey to exploit the deposits that have been found. And the truth is that with so many Greek islands in the way, not to mention Cyprus, let's say that in principle, maritime law does not seem to favour the Ottomans. The European Union itself has made a subtle defence of the maritime borders of its members, something which, of course, Erdogan is not prepared to accept for Turkey. Turkey, 780 metrekarelik Akdeniz'in zenginliklerinin üzerine adeta çökme çabası tam bir modern sömürgecilik örneği. The island Erdogan refers to is Kastelorizo. It's the eastern most inhabited Greek island. To give you an idea, it is situated more than 500 kilometers from the Greek mainland, but is barely two kilometers from the Turkish coast. And even though Erdogan mentions this island, the truth is that he could be referring to practically any other. Because in the Aegean Sea, of the more than 100 islands that have been inhabited, only two belong to Turkey. We are talking about islands that, if we read the international maritime law, seem to give Greece the rights to exploit the resources of the subsoil, while simultaneously excluding their Turkish neighbors. Given this backdrop, and knowing what we do know Know about the Turkish president, it doesn't seem likely that Erdogan will take this lying down, does it? Well, in Athens, they have exactly the same impression, so they are already getting their act together and preparing for even the worst case scenario, direct confrontation. Because even though it may seem to us like fiction or a highly improbable outcome of events, Greece is willing to defend what it considers its own. But okay, we know that the Turkish army is one of the largest in the world. So what do we know about the Greek army? Well, basically that things haven't changed much since King Leonidas. You see, the arrival of Donald Trump as President of the United States put the NATO demand that its members reach a military expenditure of 2% of their national GDP back on the table. Only 10 of the 30 countries in the Atlantic Alliance meet this objective, and in this ranking, Greece reaches a surprising second place, just behind the United States. The problem is that Greece is the only country that proportionally spends most of its military spending on paying its personnel. Come on, there may only be 300 of those fighters, but at least they seem to be well paid these days. Anyway, what's happening in Greece is very interesting. On the one hand, it spends its money on its personnel, and on the other hand, any surplus that it can devote to military equipment is used to defend itself from Turkey, which happens to be another NATO country. What nonsense. So why is there so much resentment between Greeks and Turks? Is Greece prepared to defend itself from Turkey? And perhaps the most important question of all, could the Greek economy cope with the pressure of a possible conflict? Today on Visual Politic, we will answer these questions, but first, let's take a little look at some history. The Treaty of Luzon. There are many things that separate Greece and Turkey, apart from the Aegean. This is not simply a border between two countries. No, it's a border that separates two continents, two religions, two civilizations, east and west. A frontier afflicted by centuries and centuries of confrontation. A border 
Friends, that has been a hotspot since the Trojan War, from Alexander the Great to Byzantium to the Ottoman Turks. In fact, current problems between Athens and Istanbul are due to issues that go back at least a century in time, until just after the First World War, a war that was a complete disaster for the Ottoman Empire. Defeated in the war, the Sultan was ready to accept the Treaty of Sevres, a treaty with concessions difficult to digest, such as that part of Anatolia will be occupied by Greece. For this reason, Turkish nationalists led by Mustafa Kemal Ataturk took up arms and expelled both the Greeks and the Sultan. The new Turkish Republic then negotiated a new agreement, the Treaty of Lausanne, a treaty that meant Greece would give up the eastern Thrace to Aegean Islands off the Dardanelles Strait and its interests in Asia Minor. In return, Turkey renounced its claim to Cyprus and other possible interests in the Aegean Sea, for instance, the islands of the Dodecanese. Well, the fact is that the Treaty of Lausanne is now, almost 100 years after it was signed, the cause of the main tensions between Greece and Turkey today. And you will see that there are three things that have happened in the intervening years that have upset the agreed balance. To begin with, the Dodecanese Islands, which were Italy's when the Treaty of Lausanne was signed, were handed over to Greece after Italy's defeat in World War II. Secondly, there are islets that were not expressly mentioned in the Treaty of Lausanne, but that, geographically speaking, belong to the Dodecanese archipelago. It is therefore understood that they are Greek, but nevertheless the Turks claim them as their own. And finally, the treaty set the territorial waters for the Aegean Islands at 3 miles, 4.8 kilometers. Later, Greece extended them to 6 miles, that is 9.6 kilometers, with no apparent objection from Turkey. But what no one could have known then was that by the end of the 20th century, commonly accepted international law would extend the territorial waters to 12 miles or 19.3 kilometers. But hold on a moment, because by then, the troops of both countries had already fought in a direct confrontation. The battleground was the island of Cyprus, an independent country where the Greek Cypriot majority ruled, but where there was a notable Turkish community. The fact is that in 1974, Turkey invaded the northern third of the island and established the Turkish Republic of Northern Cyprus, which, as we have covered in other videos, is not internationally recognized. And if we return to the Aegean, the most serious clash between Greeks and Turks took place in 1996 on Imea, and uninhabited island near the Dodecanese archipelago. And friends, the trigger for this conflict is very complex. At Christmas 1995, a Turkish ship ran aground in front of the islet of Emir and refused Greek help, claiming that it was Turkish territory. Weeks later, a Greek politician came to the islet and planted a Greek flag on it. In revenge, some Turkish journalists from Turkish newspaper Harriet went to the island and replaced the flag with a Turkish one. Finally, Athens sent nine Greek soldiers. They camped on the island and replaced the Greek flag. The Greek military presence put half of the Turkish navy on the warpath and the Greeks soon followed suit. War was about to be declared but the United States intervened to restore calm. Well, at this point, you might be wondering what on earth Greece and Turkey are fighting about lately. Well, the point is that Turkey is one of the 20 or so countries that have not signed the law of the Sea Convention. We are talking about the UN Treaty signed in Montego Bay, which has regulated the international law of the sea since 1994. Basically, Ankara does not accept the article in the treaty that states that islands, as well as the mainland, have a continental shelf. This is very important for the exploitation of economic resources, since Ankara claims that the Greek islands off the Turkish coast do not have their own shelf. Thus, according to this viewpoint, the zone of Greek influence in the the Aegean would begin in continental Greece, and the zone of Turkish influence on the sea would not be limited by the Greek islands. Bottom line, the natural gas would belong to the Turks. And on the other hand, although Turkey accepts the 12 mile limit of territorial waters for all countries, it makes an exception for Greece. And take note, because the issue of these 12 miles has made headlines again in 2020. Among other things, because in August, Greece decided to extend its territorial waters in the Ionian Sea, which it shares with Italy, to 12 miles. And it didn't stop there. Athens did not hesitate to issue that it would soon do the same in the Aegean. Not surprisingly, the Turkish reaction was immediate. Turkey says Greece's decision to extend its territorial waters in Aegean is a cause of war. Hurriyet Daily News. So far, it has not come to that, but the situation is more complicated than it seems at first glance. <laughs> 
You see, the centre-right New Democracy Party regained power in Greece in mid-2019, but to a large extent, it did so at the cost of feeding a nationalist agenda in order to compete with the extreme right views of the Golden Dawn Party. The strategy has been successful. But Kyriakos Mitsotakis, the Prime Minister, is now being held hostage by a nationalist faction within New Democracy with enough MPs to overthrow his governments. On the other hand, we all know the Turkish president. Erdogan has been emphatic. He assures that he will not allow the Aegean to become a Greek lake. Ankara believes that if Greece were to extend its jurisdictional waters to 12 miles, Turkey would be limited in its freedom of navigation. In this map, you can see how the political map of the Aegean would change. The question is, how on earth can all this be solved? Well, the dialogue is complicated because Athens sees no need to negotiate anything. The current situation suits them and they feel that sitting down to talk to Turkey would mean making concessions with nothing to gain. So the challenge now for the Mitsotakis government is not to get carried away by nationalists in responding to Turkish provocations. Wait a minute, provocations? What provocations? Well, for example, it is common for Turkish planes to invade Greek airspace. And not only that, recently Turkey sent the Oruk Reis, an exploration vessel, to do oil and gas prospecting in the the vicinity of Castellarizzo. We are talking about an area that Greece considers as its exclusive economic zone. In fact, a few months ago, the collision of a Greek frigate with a Turkish frigate escorting the Oruk race reignited the tensions in the air. And take note, because it cannot be ruled out that Turkey, which has taken the initiative unilaterally in scenarios such as Iraq and Syria, could organize an amphibious military operation on some island in the Aegean. And in the face of such a scenario, the question is, how exactly is the Greek army placed? Could it deter the Turks? How could it react to a possible attack? Listen up. This is Sparta! If you were in charge of Greece, your first question would probably be, how could Turkey hit us? After all, Erdogan has adopted a doctrine known as the Blue Fatherland, doctrine by which Turkey claims control of the waters of the Eastern Aegean and the Northern Mediterranean, ignoring the rights generated by all Greek islands. As you can imagine, this map has no international validity. It is only valid if you are in Turkey, or perhaps in a kebab shop. But friends, even with a good Turkish rap, the Turks have not managed to convince anyone else. Of course, that doesn't mean that Ankara doesn't have a legal ace up its sleeve. Let me explain. All those Greek islands in the Eastern Aegean were demilitarized by the Montreux Convention, an international agreement signed in 1936. However, Greece claims it now has reason to mistrust Turkey since it invaded Cyprus more than 40 years ago. Come on, no amount of Uzo would persuade them to leave any of their islands defenseless. So, in the absence of tourists, this year many Greek soldiers were seen on one of these Aegean islands. And of course, the Turkish protest was not long in coming. Turkey says Greece unlawfully put more troops on Castello Rizzo, the National Herald. Given this scenario, it seems evident where the Turkish threat could materialize. Any island in the eastern Aegean bathed in waters which Ankara claims are a part of that blue fatherland. And my friends, at present everything points to a confrontation between Greece and Turkey being marked by a clear Turkish superiority, both numerically and technologically. In fact, they have their fourth army stationed in Izmir, equipped with air and landing capabilities. What What's more, Turkey is about to have its first helicopter carrier, developed by the Turkish industry in a joint venture with, stay with this, the design of the Spanish company Navantia. Not only that, the Turkish army is also equipped with more modern weaponry and has its own arms industry at its disposal, something that Greeks lack. Even so, a mid-scale confrontation would be more balanced than it seems. Greece has been waiting for a Turkish move for decades, and has the advantage that the territory to be defended is very small, so the Turkish numerical superiority would not be so important. Of course, the worst thing for Greece could be for Erdogan to bet on a fait accompli scenario, a Putin-style strategy. If the annexation of the Crimea taught us anything, it is that the West's response to the conquest of a territory is no longer as energetic as one might expect. A lightning operation by Turkey to take over an island like Kastelorizzo, located a couple of kilometers off the Turkish coast, and with a population of barely 500 people, would give Erdogan a bargaining chip, with which to force a negotiation on his maritime rights in the Aegean and the Mediterranean. 
Well, to avoid this situation, Greece is organizing a Spartan defense of its islands. That is, in fact, what explains the troop movements denounced by Turkey. They have also set their sights on modernizing their army. The Greek government is taking advantage of all the opportunities that it has at its disposal. A most obvious one can be seen with what has been happening with the most modern fighters in the world, the F-35. Let me explain. Turkey has been a close ally of the United States since the Cold War, so neither NATO nor the White House liked it one bit that Erdogan decided to buy the S-400 Triumph air defense system from Russia. Obviously, it doesn't seem like a good idea to hand over one of your best fighter planes to someone who works with the technicians who design the missiles that are supposed to take them down. So in Athens and in Washington, they quickly saw the business opportunity. Greece will get six US F-35 fighter jets slated for Turkey, the National Herald. And not only that, Greece has also deployed its best diplomatic artistry to form a bloc against Turkey that includes countries like Egypt, with which it has concluded a maritime demarcation agreement, and the United Arab Emirates, which is wary of Turkey's ties with its rival, Qatar. They also carry out military maneuvers with countries such as Cyprus and Israel, which also clash with Turkey over gas from the Mediterranean. And they have taken very seriously the idea of dazzling France and Italy, two very influential countries that could eventually drag the European Union into confronting Erdogan. Macron, for example, has already shown strong opposition to the Turkish president, either out of conviction or because of what French politicians like best, business. Greece's purchase of French-made fighter jets worth 2 billion euro. Greek City Times. Yes, that's right. A bill of 2 billion euros for Greece, 1.7 billion euros for 18 Rafale planes, and another 300 million euros in weaponry. That's more than 2.4 billion dollars. And this is not the end of the matter. Almost 4 million people of Turkish origin live in Germany. And is it for this reason Berlin is very soft on Erdogan? Well, it seems that the next Greek order will be for four frigates from Berlin. Now, wait a minute. There is some something that's grabbing your attention. Have things changed so much in Greece that they can afford so much expenditure on military equipment? From the drachma to drama. Since Greece became a founding member of the Eurozone at the economic level, it has created nothing but trouble. They spent every last drachma organizing the Olympic Games, and since then they have lived almost constantly on the brink of crisis. For years, the words troika and rescue became more associated with this country than Greek yogurt itself. However, since then, the situation has improved considerably. Greek 10-year government bonds offer a yield of 0.68%, when in 2012 they were close to 40%. Athens can now get into debt without too much much trouble. So what is the problem then? Well, the coronavirus has once again triggered Greece's appetite for debt, and therefore the distrust of investors. Greece sees public debt at 208.9% of GDP in 2020. Yahoo Finance. In November, Greece faced its second nationwide confinement. The Greek economy will fall this year by more than 10%. As you can imagine, it doesn't seem the best time for a war adventure in which Athens has nothing to gain. Greece's military spending has grown by 10% since 2013. Of course, Turkish spending is three times higher. Therefore, even if they do want to modernize their armed forces, I'm sure that nobody in Athens wants to see one of those fighter planes that cost about 100 million euros get shot down in the Aegean. So to avoid this scenario, NATO has been the arena where Greece and Turkey have settled their differences for the time being. And what better way for an alliance that emerged from the Cold War than to provide a solution in the form of, bingo, a phone line. Greece, Turkey set up hotline to avoid clashes in Eastern Mediterranean, NATO says. Reuters. Well, as you can see, at the moment, it seems that the waters have calmed down in the Aegean. It is not in the interest of either party to continue to stir up tension, and a confrontation would probably not outweigh any potential benefits to be gained. But of course, when one of the players is Erdogan, anything can happen. Anyway, that's an outline of what could unfold. At Visual Politic, we will be keeping an eye on what happens. But now, it's your turn. Do you think Greece is taking the right steps at a diplomatic and military level to resist a Turkish offensive. Are you more of a fan of gyros or kebab? Leave your answer in the comments. So I really hope you enjoyed this video. Please hit like if you did and don't forget to subscribe for brand new videos. Don't forget to check out our friends at the Reconsider Media podcast. They provided the vocals in this episode that were not mine. Also, this channel is possible because of Patreon and our patrons on that platform. Please consider joining them and supporting our mission of providing independent political coverage. And as always, I'll see you in the next video. And if you want to learn more about politics and hear even more of my lovely voice, you can join us at Reconsider Media. We have a podcast at reconsidermedia.com slash podcast. See you there.